<laughs> were you ever were you ever spanked as a child? Yes. You were. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I went through the typical things. Mm -hmm. I for at one point I thought my my last name was Don't. <laughs> David Don't. I heard that so often. <laughs> but yeah, I went through pretty typical things as a child, and I had a sister, and we went through our all of our typical sibling things and so forth, and and it, it seems like there was nothing extraordinary. There were no when I walked around, there were no lotus petals coming underneath my feet or any f strange phenomenon. It was it was more right in I'd say in the mid the mid twenties when I started to feel these like awakening experiences and like there's much more than meets the eye here and and then the you know you if you have a, the death of a loved one you start to ask some deeper questions like how like my grandfather seemed to kind of wither away with cancer and I started asking those questions. I think with more of an urgency than before, like wh how could this happen and how could God allow this and what does God really have to do with all of this and and those things where I, you know, like I've said many times, I, I was saying I just couldn't understand how God could have anything to do with certain things in this world. Mm -hmm. And then I started to hear this intuitive voice saying, you know, I don't. And that was, it was a bit startling, you know. And I was raised in Christianity and the Apostles' Creed and God created the heavens and the earth and the typical stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and it just was like, whoa, how, but still, where did God go wrong? And, and how could, if God's all-knowing and all-loving all and all-powerful, how could, how could this ever even happen? And, and I find nowadays, even around the world, those are still some of the questions people ask. How, how, could, how could anything other than perfect love come from perfect love? How could the separation occur? That's, I call that the number one asked question of, around the world, is how did the separation happen? And even with The Course in Miracles, it's described as if it happened. And consciousness is described as if it has two parts. And and yet, when you go fully into the spiritual experience, you have an experience that literally ends the separation. Or, more accurately, you see that it never was. It never did happen. Mm. That even the ego is the one asking the question, <laughs> how did the separation happen? Hi, I'm Jennifer. So, I just, so does that, are we really here? <laughs> <laughs> you know. It's kind of like a hologram, and and, and through belief, it can make it seem like you're looking through some eyes and, and listening through some ears and touching and feeling. But, but the more you get inward through those layers of, of conditioning and beliefs, you start to have these massively expansive experiences that show you definitively that, that you are not limited. That you are not limited by a point in time and space. You know, we are not limited by, by time at all. And we tend to, you know, even as a group, we have all these great Star Trek episodes that come to us. Uh, we have so many songs and music over the years that just come flooding in. And they're all part of witnesses that, that we are not limited. They're just these glorious experiences of, of being limitless. So. So you have to be practical in the sense that if you, if you perceive yourself in time and space, you need a guide who can guide you, we could say, from the inside uh, out of that experience into a very expansive mystical experience. And I found that once I went through that experience, then suddenly these lips and these hands and this body was just used as an instrument to to inspire and to bless. In other words, uh, people would say to me all the time, like, well, I see you all over the globe and you're in all these different countries and, no, oh, you're, you're on my living room couch. How did that happen? And I'll say, well, you have a very powerful mind. <laughs> in other words, it's just, David was just a symbol drawn into the couch for someone who really wanted to just 
have a deep connecting experience and that's the way that it seemed to look in, in their dream or in the dream. And, um, you know, for many of us, you know, it comes in all kinds of ways. Music videos and uh, just, just all kinds of spectacular ways. It seems to be highly individualized and yet it's all based on what our mind can handle. So some people see visions or angels and other people just have it through interactions with uh, their fellow human beings or with, with animals, like with the deer. In forgiveness, or in the forgiven world, it's all the same. So it's like a giant tapestry that is just, it's just one dream. It's not, there's mu not multiple dreamers, there's not multiple minds or multiple private minds with private thoughts, it's just one dream. It's a very happy dream because what can harm one dream? There's no... <laughs> There's nothing to attack it. It's this ego belief that makes it seem like, we'll say, six and a half billion separate dreams. And that's why we use those no private thoughts and no people pleasing as almost like guidelines to guide us back to that unification experience. It's very much like quantum physics. You know, quantum physics is showing us now that everything is totally connected and there aren't separate bits of consciousness or separate bits of awareness. It's such as totally, it's the quantum field. It's completely unified awareness. And we're learning that, that the things that we thought were so complicated are, are only coming from this indi individualized little ego belief in which we seem to have our own separate will and our own separate little autonomy. And so things that seem immensely complicated, like for example sexuality, seems to, and on planet Earth has immense complications, to the quantum field it's, it's non-existent. There, there is no issue around sexuality to the quantum field because everything is completely unified. You might have even seen some of those movies that came out, you know, What the Bleep Do We Know and Down the Rabbit Hole, and what they were saying like, one uh, physicist was saying it was like the, the marital status of the number five. Uh, that's the kind of questions, you know, when we think about that, we think that's ridiculous. The number five doesn't have a marital status. And yet all of the issues that human beings find to be the most confusing, complex, and difficult are like that question. You know, what is the marital status of, of the number five? It, it's not even a real question. Mm -hmm. And that's to the quantum field, there are no real questions because everything's unified. Mm -hmm. So I would say the first step is, it is important to ask the right questions, only in the sense that when you ask questions about the belief system and the mind and consciousness, you are literally questioning the ego you're questioning the status quo, you're questioning all those underlying assumptions. But when you point the finger and start to question people, and you start to question like, you know, where did that tree come from, or where did that water come from, or whatever, when you point it at the, at the dream, at the forms, then you're, you're really not asking real questions, you're just you're stating that you believe that that actually exists and now you're trying to figure out how it got there and the ego's smiling, just going, oh, keep asking those kind of questions <laughs> because they go nowhere, you know. Why do, why do bad things happen to good people? The ego's sitting back there, ha, ha, ha. You'll never figure that one out, but just keep on asking, you know. But when you start to say, why am I upset here? Or what is it that I'm perceiving in this situation that's threatening? You see how that turns it back in on the ego. And the more you start introspecting, the more you start contemplating and, the, and, and uncovering with those questions, those are more like undoing questions, because you're literally like peeling the onion. You're peeling away the ego's defenses when you start to question it and you start to say, is this really what's going on here? Or is this, or what am I doing in my awareness that's, that's bringing this experience about? So that's, that's very helpful. Yes. 
then would you agree that when you begin doing that, all of a sudden, the answers to the questions you didn't even ask come? Yes. yes. You, get, you get answers to questions you weren't even aware of. Or you might say that when you start doing that, it's almost like you loosen your consciousness up, so you're allowing yourself to ask questions that you would never have even allowed yourself to ask before. And then the answers come. And so it's almost like a Sherlock Holmes of, of going in. You, you, you allow yourself to ask those questions and then they're answered. So Jesus says in the Course, uh, there are many answers that you have received but have not heard. So in other words, our divinity, the Holy Spirit, holds all the answers for us and waits until we're ready to ask the questions and really waits until we're ready to hear the answers. We have all the answers already, but we just have to be willing to ask those questions. And then beyond that, <clears throat> as you go deeper still, it's like the questions start to evaporate. They start to just dissolve away. And you actually are left without a question. And, and that's a state of, of clarity and certainty. There's not there's not these questions popping up anymore. That's how it goes. And answers come. Yeah, and they're given. Right. So even when you're in a state of stillness, if you're if you're with someone who who has a sincere question, the answers just flow out. Because that's what's being truly helpful is all about. You know, it's more your presence is really the the teaching, but the words are are given very freely. Beautiful.